Hi. Welcome to Love at First Right. I'm Victoria Doherty, and um, this is my blog chronicling my endeavors to write an epic series that is filled with romance and war and adventure and history and magic and thrills. Um, I am historically a historical uh, Cold War thriller writer, and I've 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 recently, um, or maybe not that recently, um, decided to uh, you know take a right turn here and and do something different. Um, in part uh, because um, I like to shake things up so that that my writing doesn't get stale, but also I wanted to embark on world building, on real world building and um, from scratch. Uh, something that, that comes directly uh, from my imagination and, um, and goes from there. Now, one of the things about world building, which is what we're gonna be talking about in this episode of Love at First Right is, oh God, it is just such an, uh, an awesome, Undertaking, undertaking, and awesome in every possible way. It's awesome in that it's wonderful. It's awesome, but it's also huge. I mean, it is. It is so much uh, work. Uh, it is so much mental work, and it is so rewarding for both writer and reader. And um, this is so. This is this is this is really where I want to go with this. I want to talk about how to do that. What some of the secret elements are to building a world, because that can seem, I think, tremendously uh, um, kind of scary, you know, and intimidating for a writer, and um, so worth it if you do it right for the reader and something that they can really sink their teeth into and step into and become a part of. Um, one of the reasons why world building has become so huge too is um, because it has gone beyond books and movies. It has become, um, it, you know, it, it takes you into it even further with games. Uh, you know, gaming and story is just, is so big and it just keeps getting bigger. And um, I actually embrace that. I think it's incredibly exciting to think of being able to um, take your reader who has, uh, you know, um, really connected with your story and then they can actually go into it and, and become a part of it, play as part of it, um, make decisions that, that would take um, your characters in different directions. And um, I think that that's very, very exciting. And I do have my, I do think about that as, I, as I'm writing my series, I'm thinking, you know, how would this look if someone stepped into it in that way? If someone stepped into it in terms of, of, a, of, a, of a story building kind of game and, and how fascinating that would be. Now, one of the differences, I mean, look, we all have to build a world no matter what we're writing, whether we're writing nonfiction or whether we are writing a standalone novel, you must build that world and it is a challenge. Now with a series, it's an even bigger challenge because you have to build something that um, really grabs a reader by the lapels and drags them in and and keeps them there for you know several books and keeps them wanting to be there for several books. And that is, um, in both cases, whether you're writing a single book or a series, it's a, that's a very delicate enterprise because um, on one hand, you have got to paint this world and it's gotta be so real to you and you've gotta be able to see it as you're writing. It has to be coming alive as, as you're doing your subsequent drafts. But at the same time, you have to leave space for the reader, for the reader to be able to come in and give your world um, their own little twist, you know, their own flourish, because they're gonna have an idea of what your characters look like. And they're going to have an idea of what this world looks like that um, is independent of you. And that's part of what makes um, a reader's experience rich. You know, and that's very different from something like a game or a movie where um, where that world is, is in large part created for them and they're experiencing it in a very different way. Um, in the book, that space must be left for the reader. 
and that is a huge challenge. In fact, many, uh, you know, many writers who are tremendously atmospheric and are really gifted at at writing atmosphere. Um, often you might, you know, you know, you might read one of their stories and realize that it's off-putting and that that's why that fantastic story never took off in any big way because it doesn't bring the reader in quite enough. And um, that seems to be the difference between, um, I think, the, you know, a story that, that really connects with a lot of people and, um, well, a story that, that perhaps connects with, with a much smaller group of of readers. So one of the ways that I really, um, you know, the way I struggle with this basically, and there's just no other way to put it because it is a struggle. It's a struggle that that is fun at times and really fulfilling, but it is a challenge and it is a struggle nonetheless. I've been talking to my editor a lot about this, is um, the way I approach world building is to write big starting off. <clears throat> Put in as many descriptive words, metaphors, uh, backs, put, it, put in as much backstory as possible and really kind of, at least for the first book, create this massive manuscript. And when I say massive, I mean like four or five hundred pages, you know, 140,000 words, maybe more, um, and um, start whittling it down from there. Uh, this is, um, it's a challenge. I mean, it, it's, it's hard because it puts you in a position where you have to kill your babies. You know, you have to kill some of your favorite descriptions um, that I always put aside in, in you know, a separate uh, folder because I think, well, maybe I can repurpose this in some other book or something because that was really good, but it just doesn't fit in that scene. And that takes a lot of self-discipline. It also takes taking your ego out of it because what you're trying to do with each subsequent draft is put yourself in the position of the reader. Take yourself out of the story more and more with each draft so that um, you can rid the story of the fluff. You can rid the story of, of the um, extra sorts of embellishments that may be really interesting, but when piled on in one place are distracting and perhaps self-indulgent, you know, and, and do take the reader out of the story because here they're going, okay, 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 I get it. I know what her wedding dress looks like, you know? Um, but at the same time, for instance, if you are writing a wedding, because weddings, especially in a romance, are hugely important. You want to devote enough time to them because the reader has been waiting for this. The reader has been waiting for these lovers to get together. So you don't want to just say, oh, and then they said, I do, and there they go. You know, you want to um, give them that experience of, of the particular pageantry of, of the way these two people come to have come together, um, whether it is, you know, a very simple wedding, and that's what you dwell on, the fact that it was sweet and simple, and yet um, their love burned, or whatever, <laughs> whatever it was, or that it is, you know, like uh, Harry and Meghan's wedding, and it's this big, uh, it is, it's this big to-do, you know, depending on what is appropriate for your characters, and in each case, it is absolutely imperative that um, that we are able to look at the story with a cold eye and go through it and say, no, that entire scene has to go. Um, th these descriptions have to go. Um, and, you know, tripping your way basically through a lot of bad writing in order to get to the good stuff, because um, really what, what turns a, a bad writer into a good writer is editing. It's, it's the way that we are able to, um, to make the stuff that really shines in the story come to light and put that which belongs in the background or belongs out of the story altogether um, into a different place, into a more appropriate place. Sometimes that means... Um, getting rid of characters entirely or changing a character's trajectory in order to take the focus either away from that person or or um, or shine the light brighter. And uh, it, when you're talking about building atmosphere, building a world, you have to look at it in a similar vein because there are some parts of the world that you are going to want to emphasize and that you are going to want 
to um, reference more than once through the story so that the reader really gets a taste for it. Um, and there are certain emotions that you want to evoke in a reader and juxtapositions um, that, that you may want to set up in order to really make those emotions come to the surface. And I mean juxtapositions of atmosphere. I mean, for instance, um, in this first book of the series that I'm writing, it takes place uh, in, in the desert. This is a desert culture and it's an ancient desert culture. And on top of that, you know, I really did want to be building from the ground up. So in this first book, certainly, and, and it informs the rest of the books, I am inventing an ancient culture that did not exist, but that is discovered in, in this book. And it's, as I said, it's a desert culture and the desert is hot and it is barren and it is beautiful and it is bright and vast. And so in deciding what um, scenes I'm gonna set um, in that environment and deciding exactly how I'm going to calibrate that has been really important. For instance, I'm going to set most of my war scenes, battle scenes, adventure scenes in the bright light of day so that a reader can really get a look at what is going on. And yet um, for the love scenes, for a lot of the romance that, um, that I'm bringing to this story is going to be set in the darkness. And I don't necessarily mean the night, I mean the darkness, the darkness of a cave, of a hiding place. And, um, and I've been very, uh, I've been very particular about that because I've wanted the, the darkness to reveal certain things to a reader and also to the characters, um, just as, um, you know, just as when we close our eyes and we touch something, it's very different than, than when we look at something and we touch it, or if we try to balance with our eyes closed um, on one foot, that's very different than balancing with our eyes open and being able to look at a focal point. And um, similarly, in setting some of these other scenes, these other very dramatic scenes in the daylight, um, it might, uh, it, we experience violence very differently um, in bright light than we do in the shadows. And, you know, what does that say about the story? What does that say about the characters? What does that evoke in a reader? How does that build this world? <clears throat> so, um, well, this is, this is, this is really pretty much my focus. It is, um, it, you know, in the secrets of world building, it is expanding. It's going big first and then taking out the fat, taking out the extra embroidery that um, makes it busy instead of um, fascinating. And um, in terms of the story, uh, doing the same in terms of the characters doing the same, but especially in, in sort of world building atmosphere, it is figuring out what this place looks like and how this place looks and how you present it to a reader how that reflects upon what's happening and how that brings certain characteristics of your um, of your characters to light and and in what way does you know how does that affect the reader how does that um, how does that turn the story from for instance a um, an adventure to a, to more of a romance, you know. It, it atmosphere even affects how a story would be categorized. So it is indeed something that we have to give a tremendous amount of thought, and that we have to really turn a cold eye to as we um, as we edit. So if you would like to read more, if you'd like to read chapter excerpts or backstory for. Um, for Breath, which is my series, please visit me on Patreon. Uh, it's Victoria Doherty on Patreon. Um, Patreon's fantastic. I mean, it's a great way for uh, writers and readers or, you know, artists and um, consumers of their art to, uh, to connect and to be able to support artists in a very um, wonderful and reasonable way. Thanks.